Okay. All right, ladies, let's go ahead and start um, today's lesson. I really tried to keep this one brief, but it's such a long, or within our time frame, and Lord willing, it still will be within our time frame, especially because I can't totally see these words, so I probably won't say as many of them, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, but let's, let's, let's pray, and then we're going to jump into this big portion of the text, because what I really want us to see here is that it's one portion of the text. So many times we see these particular, I feel like we see these particular instructions from Paul um, regarding uh, wives submitting to husbands, children to parents, and bond servants to their masters decontextualized. We don't see them in their context and really understand what Paul is teaching as a whole. So that's my, that's my heart and my hope this morning is that we'll see that together. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for these sisters. Uh, in the Lord. Thank you, Father, that we belong to you and that we belong to one another in and through you forever. Thank you, Lord, for your commitment to us that you have not only justified us, but it, that would have been enough, Lord, but that your commitment to us is also to sanctify us, that we might share in your holiness. And we thank you, Lord. We pray, Father, this morning that you would make us ready to receive your word in our hearts, Lord, in our minds, and in our strength, that we might worship you well and walk in a manner worthy the calling that we have received in Jesus Christ as your dearly loved daughters. How we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are starting this lesson today the way we started the last two. So at this point, we can almost begin to fill in these blanks together. But we have understood that when we hit Ephesians chapter 4, we made a shift in the book from the sort of uh, theological part, not that the whole thing's not theological, it is, um, but the part where we understand who Christ is and what he's done for us, to then chapters 4 through 6 that say, now that you understand that, walk this way. Okay, live this way. Conduct your lives in this manner. And so Ephesians chapter 4, we remember, is that turning point. And right on your listening guide there, um, that's where we're going to begin. And this is where we're given the instructions from Paul, who is therefore a prisoner for the Lord, urging us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. We learned a couple of weeks ago that that word worthy, because we've talked extensively about what it means to walk, we're gonna talk about it again today, just review our understanding, but that the word worthy means suitable because it fits, right? So we're putting on this manner of living, this conduct of life like a garment, and we want it to fit. Uh, the other helpful definition that we learned together, and this is what goes in your blank, maybe you remember, but let's write it together, is that it, it has worth, having worth that matches actual value. That's what worthy means, having worth that matches actual value. So of course then we have to ask the question, well, what is our actual value? If we don't know what our actual value is, we're not gonna know whether or not it fits. We're not gonna know whether or not it matches. And right at the beginning of Ephesians 5.1, Paul really clearly gives us our value. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And the truth that we pull from that, the thing that we are supposed to take and inter internalize and carry with us, put that in your pocket and pull it out when you forget, is that I am dearly loved by God. I am dearly loved by God. That's my actual Value. Have you ever had something that you dearly loved? That's that thing that, so remember when we were having those fires come through, um, they were actually coming through my neighborhood and, and Robert and the kids and I had to evacuate our home. And so we had to decide what, what to take with us. Those are the things, right? So then you really know, okay, I dearly love this thing. Sometimes it's something that doesn't even make sense. Like for me, it's my teddy bear, his name is Peter. He's worn, I got him when I was six years old, um, and he was coming with me, along with the kids and the dogs, <laughs> right? So I had to go and get him. Now, it didn't make a whole lot of sense that I would choose him, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that God would choose us. But if you dearly love something, he's coming with you. When everything is gonna go burn, not that. Does that make sense? Over and over again, right in the Old Testament, God calls his people, he calls them his treasured possession. 
Peter reiterates that idea for us concerning all of us, not just because in the Old Testament we understand that that treasured possession was Israel. But Peter expands that idea to both Jew and Gentile in 1 Peter 2, 9, when he says to those who are not just Jews, but those who are like us, those who were once far off, who've been brought near by the blood of Christ, but you are a chosen race. That's us sitting here in these tables, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We remember also, New Testament, that John, and remember what he was called? The disciple what? That Jesus loved, right? There's that idea again of one who is dearly loved. He sums up this whole concept in 1 John 3, 1, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. You probably learned it as a song when you were a kid, if you were in Sunday school. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. We have to understand this. Our value is so unbelievably high that our calling to walk worthy will be too. Does that make sense? That high calling is reserved for ones with high value, and that's you. Now we remember why we're walking worthy, as if that weren't enough motivation. Paul teaches us in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance beforehand that we should, there's that word again, that we should walk in them, same word. The idea of being the workmanship of God, that when God creates something, he creates it in order to, to put himself on display. He does that with nature. We see his invisible qualities, right? His divinity, his power. That's what we learn in Romans chapter 1. And in Ephesians chapter 2, we learn that we as saved sinners, when we walk in this way, are created to be a visible display. Those are your two blanks. I am created to be a visible display of the grace, mercy, and love. I did not just randomly or arbitrarily choose those words. Those are the words presented in Ephesians 2. That I am created to be a visible display of the grace, mercy, and love of Jesus to the world around me. How then do we walk worthy? And that's what Paul unpacks in the rest of this entire section going all the way to where we'll end today. Two weeks ago, he told us you're going to walk in love. Walk in love, he says, put all of these things off, put all of these things on. We looked at that together. Then uh, he says, beginning Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 14, walk in light, that we are to choose light over darkness. And then today, that we are to walk in wisdom. We are to walk in wisdom. We saw that phrase specifically. But I want us to begin right at verse 15. We've just finished the section on light where Paul's saying walk in light. So in that light then, he says, and we are, I told you last week, um, the words were plain enough. We weren't going to look at the Greek. And this week we're going to look at all of the Greek. Okay, so you have a lot of Greek words um, on your notes today. And we're just, and I didn't, I'm not going to ask you to fill anything in just to listen. And I want you to, in case, you know, I mean, writing out the transliteration is tricky enough, so I don't want to spend time on it. What I want us to get is the meaning. So I want to unpack just these first two verses and a whole lot of Greek words in them so that we can understand what he's calling us to. We can get a much bigger and better, broader picture of what it means to walk in wisdom. Here it is in our English translation. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's go ahead, and I, I'd actually like you to underline these words in your, you've got that written in your listening guide, right? So why don't you take your pencil and underline the words that we're going to pull out in the Greek. The first word is the word look. Underword the word, underline the word look. And then the word walk. The word unwise and the word wise. So look, 
walk unwise wise. Then please underline this phrase, making the best use. Underline the word foolish. Underline, please, the word understand. And finally, underline the word will, the will of the Lord. We want to look at these because if we get this from the Greek, we're going to have a significantly better understanding of what this, of what Paul, the instruction and the imperatives Paul's about to give. So, beginning with that first word, look. The word in the Greek is blepo. Blepo carefully, then. The word blepo means this. It suggests to see something physical with spiritual results. This is a different kind of looking. Okay? So it's not just looking down at the ground where your feet are going. It's look, it, it, here on the earth. It's looking down at the ground where your feet are about to land on the other side of eternity. This is what it says. It carries what is seen into the non-physical, immaterial realm so that a person can take the needed action. It's that kind of vision. That's what the word look means. Blepo carefully then. You see how this word just got a whole lot bigger. How you peripateo, we've learned that word, that word is walk, how you walk, that essentially means how I conduct my life. It has, it comes from the prefix peri, which means around, and pateo means walk, so it means the way you walk around from beginning to end, from this life into the next, full circle. Not as asophos, it's so funny, because I, I try really hard to pronounce these words correctly, and you can find every pronunciation under the sun. Blue Letter Bible, it's this man who's got to be in his 50s or 60s. He's got to be some kind of deep, uh, some, he's got to be from Texas because he's got this drawl and he just says, Asa Foss. That's the way he says that word. And then when I get, and then I, when I go to the YouTube and I go to the like Erasmus um, uh, pronunciation, it's Asa Foss. And I'm like, hi, okay. Here it is. Here's the word. It comes from the prefix a, ah, which we know even in English means not, right? And then sophos, not wise. That word sophos means wise. Now look though at what at the at the implication of that word, meaning foolish because it's rejecting God's will. Not as foolish because you're rejecting God's will or his leading. But as sophos, wise, learned, maybe circle that, that means that we are learning, we are adding to our knowledge, we're growing in the knowledge of the Lord. And then he says, cultivated. So we get this picture of one who's been pruned, of someone who's refined. Not the wild grapes, not the sour grapes that, that, that the Lord found in his vineyard in, in Isaiah, right? Not those kind of sour, wild grapes, but a cultivated vine. Because he's about to cultivate us <laughs> in, these next, in this next section. Literally, to have a taste. It's tasteful. It tastes good. That's what it means to be wise. Are you getting like a, so much more now out of this passage, out of this language? Just listen to it again. Blepo, look, right? From the, from the physical to the eternal. How you walk from beginning to end. Not as unwise, rejecting the will of God. But as wise, one who is cultivated. One who is refined in her understanding of the word. The next word is exakorazo. Exakorazo, the time. That's the whole phrase there. Making the best use. Exakorazo, the time. Because the days are evil. It comes from the prefix ex which means completely out from, and then agorazo, to buy up at the marketplace. Properly take full advantage of seizing a buying opportunity. When we were doing the pie clinic here, for those of you who came to our November pie clinic, <laughs> we were at the grocery store and we wanted a specific kind of flour. We wanted this King Arthur flour because it's the absolute best flour for making pies, right? And, we were, and so we were buying, and it's expensive. But we wanted you to have it because it's the best. You're going to get the best pie at that farm. <laughs> and Teresa's at the store, and she's looking, and she sees the price. And she and so and Janine and I know what the price of this flower is. And so we're talking together, and the price went, I mean, like, at that season, got really, really low. And we told Teresa, buy it all. Get all of it. Get everything you can. Right? 
That's what this means. Buy it all out. Every single moment, every second, buy it now. Why? Because it's got a good return on that investment, right? Make the most of the opportunity, recognizing its future gain. That's the idea here in terms of redeeming the time. Don't just buy it, buy it out. The return on this investment is like nothing else you're ever gonna buy because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be afron. That word is, un, that, that word is unwise. Don't be foolish. Okay, so it's a new word for unwise, not the asophos now, but afron, meaning ah, again, without, and fron, an inner perspective that regulates behavior. Don't be without that. In other words, don't be short-sighted, lacking the overall picture. And when Paul's saying don't be short-sighted, he's going all the way back to blepo. Don't measure your life by the days that you spend on this earth. That is short-sighted. But, suinemi, understand, but understand. Again, soon, that's with, and hiemi is to put. So put together with, join all of the facts, all of the ideas, everything you've learned for, from the word into an interlocking whole. Arrive at a summary, at a, at a final understanding that tells you how to, to live your life, how to conduct your life. Put it all together. Put it all together so that you can understand what the thelema of the Lord is. That word comes from this word thelo, to desire or to wish. And we understand from the Greek that that often refers to what, it, what we call God's preferred will. This is not his will unto salvation. You're saved. This dilemma is the preferred will of God. I love this definition from Helps Word Study. It's his best offer. His best offer to people, now, now catch this, which can be accepted or rejected. Not that you're going to be saved or unsaved. You can be, you can be saved and go to heaven having, having rejected, that's what Paul's saying, the preferred will of God, and still be saved. Or you can accept it. That, that is your response, your peripateo, your walk. Does that make sense? So here's my synthesis of the whole thing. I tried to just sort of, and I didn't put it all on your notes because I really wanted it to fit on one page. Um, and I really wanted you to see the Greek. I wanted you to see these definitions so that we could understand this. Here's my best shot at it. Grounded in the love of God, because that's where it starts. I have to understand my value or I'm not gonna walk this way. If I don't get how dearly loved I am, I will never walk this way. I will choose what is less. So grounded in the love of God, the wise believer accepts the will of God, looking ahead to see the whole picture, learning and putting together what God says in his word to make decisions in the temporary physical world based on future gain in the eternal spiritual world. That's what it means. Now, Let's jump into what is this then? What is the preferred will, that wisdom of the Lord for believers? And he begins right away. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. There are some who will use this verse um, to teach that, that believers should not get drunk, and that's true. Um, believers, it's not fitting for believers to um, to be intoxicated. However, what I want you to see is that there are two commands here, a negative one, do not get drunk with wine, and then a positive one, but be filled with the Spirit. And the Greek grammar emphasizes the second. That's the thrust. The thrust is not do not be drunk with wine. I mean, don't do that. But Paul's saying, this is what I want. He could have put an, any number of things in there. Okay, that's an important one, and we'll talk about why he chose that one in a second. But the emphasis is this, be filled with the Spirit. What's the preferred will of the Lord? Be filled with the Spirit. That's what, that's what we need to understand. The preferred will of God, his best offer is be filled with the Spirit. And what's so wonderful about this particular command is the verb tense. I'm, thank you for bearing with me with so much language today. 
but I think this is important. If we were going to render the Greek more literally, and here's what you're going to put in your blanks, the verse would read, be being filled with the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. Because here's what's going on with this command and with, and with the three that are about to follow. Four things we want to understand about this verb tense. First, it's an imperative. When he says, be being filled with the Spirit, it's an imperative. That means it's not optional for believers. This is not optional. Second, it's plural. It's a plural imperative, meaning that it's addressed to the entire Christian community, that we are all to be filled with the Spirit. This is not an elite status or a privilege. This doesn't just belong to Pentecostals, right? Or charismatics. This is available for all the people of God, and it's a command. Third, it's passive. Okay, it's an imperative. It's plural. It's passive, which means that the results of being filled with the Spirit, okay, which in this passage Paul is going to say are going to be seen in singing, thanksgiving, and submission, are not the work of our effort, but they are the outworking of the Spirit of God in our lives. When the Spirit fills us, these graces will be present in our lives as an overflow of joy expressed in deep thanksgiving to God and glad-hearted submission to others. It's the work of the Spirit, and it's the evidence of grace. You're not going to manufacture these. You're not going to go submitting to your husband. You're not going to go raising your children well. You're not going to be uh, uh, being a good employee in your workplace in this way, in the way Paul's talking about, with an eternal reward without the Spirit of God. It's an outworking of the filling of the Spirit. That what we should seek is to be filled with the Spirit. And finally, and this is super cool, it's present tense. Now in Greek writes uh, our Bible scholar John Stott. I, I study him a lot. There are two kinds of imperative. Okay? An aorist describing a... So there's an aorist per, uh, imperative, and that describes a single action, and then a present... So there's aorist, and then there's present imperative, where the action is continuous. So when Jesus said during that wedding reception at Cana, go fill the jars with, wa with water, he says, fill the jars with water... That was an aorist imperative, since the jars were just going to be filled one time. Fill them and it's done. Does that make sense? But when Paul says to us be filled with the Spirit, here's Stott still um, writing here, he uses a present, a present imperative implying that we are to go on being filled. For the fullness of the Spirit is not a once-for-all experience which we can never lose, but a privilege to be renewed continuously by continuous believing and obedient appropriation. Now let's get this straight. We've been sealed with the Spirit once for all. When you're sealed with the Spirit unto salvation, you have the Spirit of God. But being filled with the Spirit is a continual thing that happens throughout our lives. It is almost more helpful to think of ourselves not like a glass being filled with water so much as a balloon being filled with air. Because you can fill a balloon, right? You can blow air into a balloon and, and, and tie it off, and it's all the way full. That balloon is full. Does that make sense? But I also have the option to do what? I can fill that balloon more. That balloon can be more full. Does that make sense? And I can let that, as that air escapes, and I can fill it again. But it never has a gap. It never has a space. So we want this, when we're talking about being filled with the Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit, I want you to think of it more that way. Because thought says we need to be filled with the Spirit and go on being filled every day and every moment of the day. And anyone who's walked with Christ for any amount of time knows that that's true. So we want to remember this. We are learning to walk worthy so that Christ can be seen. Remember, we're a visible display. We want Christ to be seen in our world, his, gr his grace, his mercy, and his love. So let's just get this out of the way. Why then does Paul say, do not get drunk with wine? Why did he choose that? What happens when we're drunk with wine is that we are now under the control of a different spirit. And we are putting a different spirit on display. That's why he picks it. That feeling of being drunk with wine makes us happy. That's why we do it, right? 
It can give us this sense of temporary joy, but it's a joy, and here's how it's different from the Spirit. It's a joy that's out of control. Being filled with the Spirit, contrarily and amazingly and astoundingly and wonderfully, just the complete opposite. It gives us more control. It gives us self-control that is a fruit of the Spirit. And that self-control from the Spirit overflows with a joy that's not just for this time and for this moment. It's with a joy that is forever. That's forever. John Stott, excuse me, Stott, Stott, so many Johns. John Piper makes this um, observation. I want to read it to you exactly because it was so perfect. He says, when you are happy in God, you are a strong and brave witness to his grace. Do we understand that? When we have joy in God, that is a strong and a brave witness to the world, to the grace of God. So he says, so I repeat, whatever joy or peace you find in alcohol, the Spirit of God can give you more. David says it this way, Psalm 4, verses 7 and 8. He writes, let the light of your face shine on us. You, Lord, fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. So when their grain and their new wine are abounding, Father, fill my heart with joy. And then he says this, in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. That is something that you receive from the Lord that you, that, that bottle of wine will not give you. And for those of us who have been in that place, we know it. Now, from that imperative, that imperative to be being filled with the Spirit... We get, and this is why I wanted to give you this passage. My Bible's open to Ezekiel, and it's throwing me off right now. <laughs> so I just here, let's leave it there. Romans. Um, <laughs> uh, from that imperative, and this is what I want you to see, the rest of this passage, all the way to 6-9, comes straight out of this. So this idea of be being filled with the Spirit is this. Then, when we are, when we are filled in this way with the Spirit, these following graces, these effects of that filling are going to pour out of our Spirit-filled lives. Here's your first one be singing it's the same verb tense be doing this continually be singing in your hearts to god and in fellowship with each other we saw it in verse 9 it's 19 addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the lord with your heart the result of the spirit's work in our lives is renewed worship it's renewed worship. Beth Moore posted an Instagram story this last week. She was taking her dogs for a walk in the woods, which she does just about every morning. And she was walking through the woods, and she was singing, um, and I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Right? She's singing this song, and she wrote this. She, she's got this little caption on the video as she sings. She says, we don't need a good voice. And she doesn't have a particularly good voice. She says, we don't need a good voice. Just sing. Just sing and sing and sing. A song tiptoes past all our defenses and tells our hearts that despite it all, we are happier than we know because there's Jesus. The other, the other aspect of singing that we want to see here is that it's kind of twofold in this passage, right? We're singing, there's a, there's a horizontal relationship and there's a vertical relationship. We sing to God and we sing to one another. And what, and what we need to understand um, Bible commentator O'Brien tells us is that Paul is not teaching two different responses of singing, one to another and one to God. They're not two different things. It's the same activity from two different perspectives. He says, remember this, when we gather for corporate worship, when we gather here and we sing to God, we are also ministering to one another. That's what he's saying. The second grace coming out of being filled with the Spirit is that we will be thanking God through Jesus Christ. We will be thanking God for Jesus Christ. Verse 20. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. John Stott reminds us that the call to thanksgiving is not uncommon in Paul's letters. Right? That grumbling spirit is not compatible with the Holy Spirit. We see it in all of Exodus. Right? The people are murmuring against the Lord and against Moses. But the spirit-filled believer is not full of complaining but of thanksgiving. And after everything we've read, in all of chapters 1 through 3, how can we not overflow with thanksgiving? Understanding who God is, who Christ is, and what he's done for us, how he's called us, how he's loved us, how he's set his affection on us. And we are to give thanks, Paul says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how thanksgiving is given. 
by the spirit-filled believer. So the question is, what are we known for? Are we known for whining? Are we known for arguing? Or are we known for thanksgiving? Because when you are women filled with the spirit, known for thanksgiving, the goodness of Christ is seen in us. And finally, here's the last one. The final grace that he lists here, I'm confident there are more, but he lists these three. Be singing, be thanking, be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is always the tricky one, the one where we get tripped up. I would love to see what you came up with at your tables for what submission means. Ultimately, here's the bottom line of submission, of what it means to submit. Submission means putting another's will above your own. That's what it means. Submission means putting another's will above your own. One thing that I want us to see here in these next three areas where Paul's going to explore um, this idea of putting Christ's will above our own is that in each one, he begins the instruction to the one who is in the submissive role, right? He begins first in, the, in our next passage with wives, they're the ones in the submissive role, with children and with bond servants, rather than the one who's in the leadership role. Why? The question is why? Why, to think about this for a second, why does he begin with wives and children and bond servants? Why does he begin with the one that he calls to be in that submissive role? Here's what I want to present. Here's what I want to suggest. Here's what I want to posit. Because that's who we are in our relationship with Christ. That's who we are. Before anything, the Lord is instructing us in our relationship with others as they reflect our relationship with him. Right? Clearly in our relationship with Christ, we're the ones in the submissive role. He's the one in the leadership role. So every single time, we've got to see this. Because this is not, remember, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If he gives us instruction, it's for our good. So every single time he says, here's how, that, that he gives us one of these instructions, right? If, he, if, if what I'm saying is right, then every time he says, Here how the, here's how the one in the leadership role should act in your relationship, he's promising that that's how he's going to act toward us. That's how he will act toward us. Remember, we are a visible display of the mercy and the love of the grace of God. So naturally, or maybe more accurately, supernaturally, when we walk out our relationships with others in such a way that our relationship with him is seen, then, right, then we get this a very healthy and very right perspective on what he's calling us to do here in our own submission. We are submitting to him. We are submitting to him. In fact, if we were going to more literally render the Greek, submitting to one another, beginning in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, the verse follows, wives to your husbands. Not wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Not that that submit to your, that submit right there is added for understanding. But in the Greek, it just flows straight out. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives to your husband, children to your to your parents, bond servants to your masters. That's why I want you to see these three things together. Okay, because he's just going through our natural relationships. So here's we let's begin with the first one. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now we remember this, and we remember this always. Because our first submission is to Christ, we don't submit to sin in our marriages. Let's just get that out of the way. If your husband's twisting the word of God, manipulating you with the word of God, asking you to do something that is sinful, the answer is no. We don't submit to sin. We submit to our husbands as an outworking of our submission to Christ. He forbids us to, to submit to sin. So let's just get that settled right now. Okay? But let's not throw out the instruction 
in the, in the process. Well, let's continue. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Listen to how much he's going to talk about himself right now. How much the Lord's going to talk about himself, not your earthly husband. That he might say, who? That your husband's going to sanctify you? No. He's talking about Christ in the church. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her with the washing of water, with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound. Remember that word mystery is, means revealed truth. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The reason he spent so much time on that husband role is because he's talking about himself. And so then you need to remember and I need to remember who I am and whose I am if I'm going to get this submission thing right. You are, here are your blanks, you are the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. Through Paul, who is clearly taken, he gets absolutely overwhelmed, right, with the beauty of the relationship between Christ as the husband and the church as his bride. The Lord is saying this. He's saying, you are my bride. I am your husband. Come submit to my leadership because I love you as I love my own body. And he says, my desire and my commitment to you is to present you to myself in absolute splendor. So then with that understanding, go. And live out your earthly marriages so that my love for you can be seen. That's the idea. You are the bride of Christ. So submit to one another out of reverence for Christ in your marriages. It's going to be very difficult for a woman who believes in the Lord and who professes faith in Christ to be um, unsubmissive to her husband in her earthly marriage. Again, not a sinful marriage, but unsubmissive to her husband. And not only <laughs> put on display the perfection of Christ in his relationship to us as husband, but to even believe it herself. Does that make sense? Here's what this means. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ in your marriages. That means put Christ's will above your own in your marriage and be bravely willing to ask this question. And I'm going to ask it of each single one. Um, and we've got two more to go here to finish our passage, but this, this type, this, this line of thinking, is my husband more like Christ if he's a believer, or is he more able to see Christ if he's un, an unbeliever because he's married to me? Or is he more like Christ, or is he more able to see Christ in spite of being married to me? That's the question. That's what we're going to ask, same type of question here. Do you see it now? You see how important this is? Children, obey your parents. Here comes the next one. In the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are, right? You are, can you fill this one in? You are children of God. You are children of God. Through Paul, the Lord saying, you are my children, I am your father, honor me, and I will not provoke you to anger, but I will instruct you and I will discipline you for your good so that your life will produce a harvest of righteousness. So then in your relationships as children and parents, whichever part of that you're in, put those roles on display so that my good plan and my pleasure and my love and my provision can be seen in the world. You're children of God, so submit to one another out of reverence for Christ in your families. That means, let's just, let's just get this in our minds, put Christ's will above your own in your families. Be willing to ask the question, are my children or are my parents more like Christ if they're believers or more able to see Christ if they're unbelievers because of my relationship with them or in spite of? So 
We see our relationship with Christ reflected and put on display in our marriages, in our families, and then here's the last one, in our jobs, in our work relationships. That's what he's talking about here in the very last one. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. Go ahead and fill in your blanks. You are bond servants of Jesus Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters do the same to them and stop your threatening. Knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Clearly, we are bond servants. We are employee, employees, essentially, of Jesus Christ. Now, the word in Greek for bond servant is doulos. It properly means someone who belongs to another, a bond slave. And what's so fascinating is that word doulos is used with the highest dignity in the New Testament. Namely, of believers who willingly live under Christ's authority as his directed followers. It's a, will, it's a willing servitude. Essentially, you are the ambassador of Jesus Christ. So submit to one another out of reverence for Christ in your employment. Right? Put Christ's will above your own in your jobs. Be bravely willing to ask that question. Are my employees or my employers, are they more able to become like Christ, right, if they're believers, or to see Christ if they're unbelievers because of their working relationship with me or in spite of it? Now, when we have the confidence, and we're going to end right here, and the security to ask those questions, because it takes, it takes some courage to ask a question like that, right? When we have that confidence before the Lord, knowing that we have been justified by him and that his commitment to us is to sanctify us, and we have that commitment to walk worthy in the wisdom of God that says, this is my best offer for you, Right? Walk it here in this world in such a way that will bring you great reward when you are finally home with me. We can only do that because we know that we are dearly loved. It's the love of God that anchors us. It's the love of God that compels us. So that's here's your final thought from Charles Spurgeon. I just want to read it to you and then we'll pray. If the love of Christ is the most amazing thing under heaven, if not in heaven itself, how often have I said to you that I have heard that Christ pitied, pitied us, and I could understand it. If I had heard that Christ had mercy upon us, I could comprehend it. But when it is written that he actually loves us, that is quite another and more extraordinary thing. Love between mortal and mortal is quite natural and comprehensible, but love between the infinite God and us poor sinful creatures though conceivable in one sense, is utterly inconceivable in another. Who can grasp such an idea? Who can fully understand it? Especially when it comes in this form. He, and he literally writes, read it in large capitals. He <laughs> loved me and gave himself for me. This is the miracle of miracles. Listen, <laughs> this is the love that frees us. This is the love that fills us. Right? It fills us to sing, it fills us to give thanks, and it fills us to submit one another out of the love that we have for the one who set us free. That is the love that compels us. Because, and we're going to read, when we get to the book of 2 Corinthians, we are Christ's ambassadors, and here's the miracle. And this is why he's saying these things to us, because through us, he makes his appeal the world. Let's pray. Father, this morning we pray that as beloved children, as dearly loved daughters, we might become imitators of Christ who loved us and who gave himself for us. And so, Father, fill us with your spirit. Teach us to submit to one another out of reverence for you, that Christ might be seen in our lives now and that our lives might result in praise and glory on the day that Jesus Christ is revealed. 
And so we pray, come, Lord Jesus. The Spirit and the Bride say come. We ask these things boldly, with great hope and anticipation. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only Savior. Amen. All right, ladies, next week we finish it. Thank you.